So hello, my name is Sarah Breen and I'm the principal investigator of the Navigating Rural Project. Myself and my three research assistants, Courtney, Laurel and Mark, are here today to provide an overview of our project. Sustainable transit is essential to rural communities. However, despite the importance and the increased options available, rural communities continue to struggle with sustainable public transit services. The goal of our project is to use place as a lens to critically assess what we know about rural transit. And with that in mind, our team set out to understand rural specific barriers to developing transit, what issues exist related to funding for transit, and what innovative solutions are out there already. And today we're presenting some of the highlights of our projects, starting with rural specific barriers. Hi there. Today I'll be discussing the barriers that rural areas face in terms of establishing transit systems. And so I'll go over the purpose of my work, my results, and the next steps of my research. So it's important to understand the unique barriers that rural areas face in terms of establishing transit systems, because at the end of the day, these barriers essentially determine whether or not people can get to where they want and need to go in a safe, reliable, and efficient manner. And in addition to understanding what these barriers are, it's also important to understand how these barriers differ between rural areas, because once we have this additional understanding, we can then direct policy and direct funding to specific communities that face specific barriers. And so um, from my work, I identified several thematic barriers um, to establishing rural transit systems, but the four on the left of my screen stood out the most. So first off, there were barriers related to socio-cultural aspects within the rural areas. So this could be, you know, the perceptions that individuals have related to transit, if it's um, safe, efficient, reliable, if it's cool, for example. There were also barriers related to the demographics in rural areas. Um, and so transit in rural areas tends to be more expensive than in urban areas. And in rural areas, the individuals that tend to rely on transit the most tend to have the least financial resources to actually afford this service if it does exist. There were also barriers surrounding governance structures, whether it related to the transit service provider or local government. And oftentimes there was a lack of resources to actually provide transit services. So, these could be financial resources or, or human resources to actually provide a service. And finally, um, there were barriers surrounding the natural and built environments within rural areas. So land use development patterns in rural areas tend to have different land use types spread over large distances. So for instance, your home probably tends to be far away from where you do your groceries. So these large distances between, um, between places drives up the cost of transit service. And so, um, you know, the logical next step would be once we know what these barriers are to then look at how these barriers differ between rural areas or have a place-based understanding of the barriers. So I've come up with a couple preliminary place-based barriers. So the first one, to understand is the type of rural that we're talking about. So for example, Huron County in Ontario will face extremely different barriers than Whitehorse Yukon Territory. Another place-based barrier to look at is the politics of the area that we're talking about. So for example, a more right-leaning rural area may not be as apt to increase taxes to provide a, a service like transit. And of course, there are many more place-based barriers that we can consider, which is why the next steps of my research are to delve into these place-based barriers so that we can have an intimate understanding of the specific types of barriers that rural areas face in terms of establishing a transit system. And so the saying goes that when you've seen one rural community, you've seen one rural community. And this just essentially means that the term rural accounts for, you know, a multiplicity of different communities 
And so transit policy has an opportunity to respond in a place-based manner to this multiplicity of rural areas that face a multiplicity of barriers. And I'll hand it off to Laurel now, thank you. So hello everyone. So my part in this project was to identify the existing programs from across Canada that have been successful in supporting transit systems in rural communities, as well as identify the rural specific barriers and gaps in the supporting programs that have prevented rural communities from accessing the existing transit support funds. So to do this, I first uh, created a list of transit programs that exhibited all the qualities that were required for their inclusion in our research and imported them into a coding program uh, called the Vivo. And then using the Vivo, I was able to do a qualitative analysis on the programs to identify the main barriers, as well as the group the common themes from each of the funding programs um, into codes. And so our requirements to be included in this program or in, into our research was that they must be Canadian, um, and that they had to be specific to rural areas. So from my analysis, I was able to find that the two main barriers for rural communities to get funding was one, the lack of information, and two, um, just the lack of rural considerations within the funding programs. So trying to find information on how to apply for the funding programs um, is extremely difficult. And many of the current and existing programs don't have any information accessible to just everyday individuals to find how to apply for their programs and how to get grants for money. Um, and in smaller communities, like rural communities, who may not have people in uh, human resource positions who are qualified and experienced in, in applying for grants and loans um, and funding programs, may miss out on opportunities to actually get funding that could support the communities as well as transit systems. And then the second main barrier that I found was that there was a lack of consideration for rural areas. So rural areas with populations smaller than 25,000 um, often get beat out by larger municipalities and communities who will be using their transit system uh, more often and get a better revenue for the transit system. So a lot of the smaller communities uh, will miss out for the larger communities just with the competition and um, the resources that the, provin the province has to give uh, for different programs. So this is just a hierarchy tree um, showing the barriers that I found, the most common ones, as well as just hinting of the um, lack of information and absence of rural considerations. Um, so to code the barriers, I had either they were present or they were absent. Um, the absent, as you can tell on the bottom for accessible information is almost equal to the present. That's why it was the main barrier that I found. Um, and for people, can, especially older people who may not be comfortable using technology, um, it's definitely a very real and hard to address issue. And then for rural considerations, again, they just didn't have the, um, <laughs> just didn't have the uh, resources to give to smaller communities, um, especially in these big grants that the government's giving out for half a million dollars. They're going to larger municipalities and smaller municipalities. And yeah, um, so I'll just hand this off to my coworker, Mark, who is doing the GIS analysis. Welcome everybody to our, uh, our map of rural transit case studies in Canada. Uh, I'll start by briefly introducing uh, our data, and then I'll give a, a quick tour of some of the layers that we have produced, as well as a couple of specific uh, innovative cases that we found quite interesting. Uh, initially, we were looking to identify innovative case studies across the country, but as we were collecting data, we realized that more traditional rural transit systems and their locations also had uh, some wisdom to impart. So we included many of them in the map as well. Although not a comprehensive list, uh, it gives us a, a good idea uh, of where both uh, the case studies and the literature relating to them uh, occur. So the, uh, the first map layer that we're going to look at 
um, is uh, the transitional, the tra traditional transit systems uh, in dark green uh, with our short list of innovative case studies uh, in light green, which we had earmarked for, for further study. Uh, the blue gradient in the background denotes population density. Uh, the darker the color, the, uh, the denser the population. So there are three, three main things to note here. Uh, the first is the absence of more traditional transit systems in it, the Atlantic provinces, uh, which is, is sort of interesting. Um, second, the higher density rural transit systems and their proximity to urban centers in uh, both southern Ontario and southern Quebec. And then lastly, uh, note the cluster uh, in British Columbia, likely due to the presence of BC Transit, uh, which is a trend that we will see also in, uh, in other layers as we progress. The second layer that we will examine um, is transit type. And this layer has been color coded according to uh, which type of transit uh, is the predominant uh, type of public transit in the area. Um, and that might be a traditional fixed route system um, or a ride share, car share, uh, etc. Um, and there are three areas I'd like to note here. Uh, the first is to note the diversity of transit types in southern Ontario. Uh, there's not one uh, dominant uh, transit type, uh, so that's sort of uh, interesting to note. Also we see BC Transit's influence uh, with the cluster of yellow denoting fairly homogeneous combination of fixed route and on-demand door-to-door transit for people with mobility challenges. Although there are some exceptions to that in BC, um, that seems to be the, the dominant mode of, of uh, transit employed. Also of interest is the cluster of green car shares in southern Quebec. These are part of the Soviet Systems Pilot Project in which small municipalities uh, have added electric cars to their municipal fleets and have them available for car sharing to the general public when they're not in use. Uh, and these are, have been employed in, in municipalities that are too small to have a, a more traditional uh, transit system. Uh, and it's innovative on three different fronts. Firstly, the use of less traditional car sharing uh, as a transit type. Uh, second, the use of green technology to reduce emissions. And third, the implementation, implementation of technology in the, uh, the Soviet systems car sharing software. Um, so an interesting uh, case and uh, yeah, worth further exploration. And then the third layer that we will take a look at uh, is ownership. And this layer is coded uh, yeah, according to ownership uh, of the transit system. This is a, a quite a complex topic as there are many uh, different combinations um, and partnerships involved. Um, but for the purpose of this, we'll, we'll just look at, at a couple. Uh, I'd like to draw your attention to some of the differences as we move across the country. Uh, yet again, in British Columbia, we'll see a, a predominantly green uh, uh, representation, uh, and that is a public partnership uh, through BC Transit, uh, which local, regional, and provincial governments all work together. Um, and it's only one of three systems in North America that uses this sort of umbrella uh, type system uh, and the only one in Canada. So that's interesting. Uh, it allows them to use, uh, you know, some of the, the uh, strategies that are, that are appropriate for, for the local situation, but also uh, leverage the resource sharing from the, the larger system. In Southern Ontario, you'll notice, uh, and, and Southern Quebec, uh, it's dominated by public ownership, uh, denoted in orange, and then on the East Coast in the Atlantic uh, provinces, you'll notice it's predominantly nonprofit ownership uh, denoted in yellow. One specific interesting example of this is the Rural Transportation Association in Nova Scotia, which provides door-to-door -door accessible ride services through its many independent member organizations. Interestingly, it benefits in, in some similar ways uh, to BC Transit through sharing administrative resources, etc but they're independent organizations uh, just under, organized under one, one association. Anyway, I hope you have found this little glimpse into the distribution of rural transit systems in Canada, Canada to be of interest. So thank you for taking the time to attend our presentation today. The final report for this project will be completed and publicly available by, the, uh, by Christmas time this year. In addition to the report, we're also going to have a web map showing the, the examples that Mark was speaking to earlier, 
uh, as well as coming up with several shorter summary briefs. The findings of this project are, are gonna help to shed light on rural transit, the different challenges and the different needs, as well as all of the creative and innovative solutions that already exist. And just finally to say thank you to our project partners, as well as to the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada and Infrastructure Canada for their support of this project. And we're happy to take questions in the discussion forum. Thanks.